All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to start by saying, like, like we were talking beforehand, that um, I'm doing this primarily because of taking your class. So I took it and I was just completely interested the whole time. I was um, a little bit uh, daunted at first, or it was a little bit daunting. I don't really like doing presentations and we had a couple, but I ended up just loving them and your feedback was great. And I just really liked the way you set up your class. Awesome. Thank really, you so much. No problem. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you here. It's um, exciting for me to be able to talk to you in person. It's nice to finally meet you. <laughs> um, my first question was just, so why evolutionary psych? Is, have you always been interested in it? Or? So I started out studying psychology in my undergrad. And when I originally started that path, I thought I would get into counseling or clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. And I took one course in evolutionary psych and loved it. And then I decided to do the honors program, which means I needed to meet with like a, I had to have a mentor or a supervisor. And I ended up working in a lab that was really mixed between biology and psychology that used a lot mm -hmm. of evolutionary frameworks. And yeah, it just kind of hooked me. And I'd say mainly because I like the really broad explanatory power. Yeah. You know, that you can kind of have these simple ideas and it seems to give you a lot of information about why people are the way that they are. Mm -hmm. So I did kind of start thinking I would study more of the individual, but then I got more into this, like studying like the species or like, kind of group dynamics. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, you said you're finishing your PhD right now? Um, I'm on maternity leave still. Right. But I'm going to start back up in January okay. and hopefully be done by the summer. Well, that's I don't exciting. Wanna, I don't want to set a hard deadline because yeah, no, going back to school with two little kids and my husband works yeah. full time, so... There's a lot of logistics to sort out, but I'm I'm hoping in June. June is kind of feeling like a good goal That's to good. finish. Yeah, it's exciting. What is it like going through the process of being a PhD candidate? Is it pretty intense, or it's? I think my path has been pretty unique because I ended up doing my master's degree and my PhD with the same person with Bernie Crespi at SFU, mm -hmm. and lots of people recommend not doing that because like it's good to branch out and work with different people but for me it was really important that I could have the type of lifestyle and schedule I wasn't ready to throw myself into a PhD where I'd have to like move far away or like commit to crazy work hours right so I am a student at Simon Fraser which is in BC mm -hmm. so I do all my work remote and since Bernie and I had already had a good relationship um, he was willing to be a little bit flexible on what I was studying because I initially wanted to work on a project about the origins of the female orgasm mm -hmm. and I was having a hard time finding someone local that had the right approach so I talked to him and we kind of found a way we could work on it together and so the yeah the program was kind of unique to me because it's all been remote it's been like mostly self-study and overall it's been good because I could work my own hours and you know work in a coffee shop right uh, but I ended up really missing the social aspect which I didn't really realize until recently because that's fair. But then it ended up working out because with the pandemic, I would have been working this style anyway. So I was already used to working that way. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It's changed a lot for everyone. I think, unfortunately, I'm not a huge fan of it, of working from working remote, but um, it does definitely have its pros. So. Yeah. I, I miss like being around other people, which is why I usually like to leave my house and work. Cause I have mm -hmm. a hard time actually getting work done at yeah. home. Yeah. I like the like hustle and bustle of a environment. I've heard too before that I don't know if it's true, but um, that there's something about being able to leave and go to an office or to a classroom just because you're separating, like your relaxation environment from your work environment. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much evidence there is to it. It but. makes sense to me, like just in terms of uh, conditioning principles. Like they people say too to not do like work in your bed or bring your computer into your yeah. bed because that should be the place where you relax exactly yeah and in my house i ha usually have the kids there even if someone's watching them and it's just way too chaotic mm -hmm. <laughs> to get work yeah done. no kidding so the uh, origins of the female orgasm why did you pick that topic so funny enough in my undergrad when i first took evolutionary psychology that's what i wrote my research paper on there. oh yeah and so that would have been probably in 2006 so i've been following this area of literature for a long time mm -hmm. um the the question in evolutionary psych is this like why do females have orgasms because the male orgasm has an obvious function because it's connected with the ejaculation mechanism mm -hmm. so it's 
clearly tied to reproduction. But in women, there's not an obvious tie. Like women can get pregnant without having an orgasm or never having had an orgasm. Um, But there's like features of orgasm that, uh, or orgasm seems to be more likely with males that have certain indicators of fitness. So there's this been a big debate for a long time. And this is a debate I've been following that it either was selected for because it contributes to female reproductive success in some way, or that it's a byproduct of males having orgasms. Mm -hmm. And so I was following that debate and I originally wrote my paper like back when I was an undergrad saying that it had a function in terms of mate choice. So females being more likely to have orgasms with males of high quality and would reinforce right. that bond. And then I shifted away from that. And sometime during my master's degree, I got really interested in this idea that orgasm has to have some relationship to childbirth. And I hadn't seen anyone just look at that or study it at all. So that was the idea I got really hooked on. And I worked on that a lot in my PhD. But funny enough, that's the project that's undone and that needs more work Mm. and now i've had two babies too so now i have some personal (laughs) experience with birth and i'm it's still kind of this like i'm I'm not quite sure where i'm going with the project that's fair but i wanted to connect the two worlds of like female sexuality and childbirth Mm -hmm. because they are usually studied really separately and they're often really studied like from a pathology perspective what goes wrong with both and i wanted to explore the kind of mechanisms that overlap in both of them did you find anything? Yeah, I have to bring my brain to focus because <laughs> yeah, sure. like it's been a while since yeah. I, I kind of needed a break from that. But uh, well, firstly, there are like small a small you know group of women that do have orgasms during childbirth, mm. so that's interesting. And there's oh, more, really? Yeah, yeah. and the, there's a kind of more in the natural birth world, or we maybe even call it the ecstatic birth world. Mm. This idea of kind of like surrendering to the bodily processes. Um, and like allowing the intensity of the sensations can create the possibility to have mm. orgasm. And so some women do actually experience childbirth as pleasurable, but it seems to be a pretty small amount. Like, yeah. You know, obviously like most people would say it's like the most painful. Yeah. Yeah. I've never, I don't, again, I don't know if this is true, but I've always heard that it's on par with like being lit on fire. Like, mm. so I don't, I've never just... been lit on fire, <laughs> 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 but I would say, especially my first birth, like, it the intensity of it like shocked me and like i'm have have been like a pretty athletic person or mm. you know i've done things i don't know like had tattoos or piercings or uh and like committed to some pretty intense physical activity but it it shocked me like the amount of physical strength and endurance i needed to have and mental oh, like, yeah, toughness yeah. to get through it because i was really committed to having a natural birth as well right so i didn't have any um, drugs or inductions and I was at home too um, but in terms of its connection to orgasm I guess what I'm what I'm struggling with is the, like trying to see if there's some kind of like causal relationship between the two so I did explore a bunch of literature that suggests maybe not directly but at least indirectly that women who are more orgasmic or more like open sexually would have an easier time giving birth Right. And um, I was thinking that that would have some like psychological and physical explanations, right? If like the mm-hmm. pelvic floor is um, more relaxed, um, if a woman's more aware of her body, she's able to relax through intense sensations, then the process of both orgasm and birth, which are like a fairly automatic process, can unfold less inhibited. So, right. yeah, sort of like. Um, psychological and physical inhibitions but I also studied the hormonal overlap because there's a lot of hormonal similarities between the two too like the peak and oxytocin yeah so this is kind of the project I have to finish up yeah to finish my PhD because I have a whole other section of research on a different topic that's fairly done oh I see it's it's really interesting it seems like you've done quite a bit already so yeah it just feels like it's like the main connection is still missing Mm. but I'm thinking maybe I don't Maybe it doesn't need to be like a finished story I can bring up. What I want to do is like point out missing gaps. Because, mm. you know, as lots of academia, it's mostly been men writing on yes. it. And sometimes when I read the female orgasm literature, it's like, it's like a big part of the story missing. And I just wanted to bridge those two worlds. 
because there's a lot of reasons why you know people haven't re- researched childbirth or sexuality a lot because those have been mm. taboo subjects i was reading some of your stuff from your website and it seemed like a lot of the um historical ideas for the causes are pretty ridiculous like yeah they just don't really make a whole lot of sense like intuitively there's some pretty comical ones out yeah. there like the idea that the orgasm tires a woman out so she lays flat on her back for a while so the semen doesn't fall out and then she's more <laughs> likely to get pregnant because a lot of people have tried to make that link and there's still mm-hmm. like there's modern versions of that where the orgasm through the oxytocin in like a uh, makes the uterus contract and then it pulls up the sperm mm. uh, but the evidence for that is just not very strong yeah. so because there's still no link like women who've never had an orgasm get pregnant all the time mm-hmm. so it's kind of yeah it's, it seems like they're just looking for just any kind of easy way to explain it almost people and this has been a criticism and elizabeth lloyd has written a big book on uh, the female orgasm and using it as an example of how there's a lot of bias in evolutionary studies because she's like people are so fixated on like it has to have an explanation or it has mm-hmm. to have a reason where she's like a lot of things in you know evolution end up being a byproduct or like a kind of an outcome of some other pressure right and she's and she kind of goes at it from a feminist angle like why does it have to have a function like maybe it's just this great happy accident <laughs> that yeah. evolution created no kidding well speaking of byproducts you mentioned that at one point that it might be a byproduct of the male orgasm yeah what do you mean by that so and this is elizabeth lloyd talks about this idea and some biologists before her time too that so since male orgasm is it is a different mechanism than ejaculation but they're tied together and you know right. most of the time and since there's a lot of pressure selective pressure on ejaculation to work properly so we can say there's strong selection on male orgasm and males and females you know, develop very similarly embryologically. So the male would need, you know, erectile tissue to develop in utero. And because of those overlapping embryological developmental processes, females end up with the erectile tissue as well. And so we end up with a capacity to orgasm, but it doesn't, it's not connected to a function. So that's sort of the byproduct idea. So the the two main parts, you have the strong selection on male orgasm and the shared development Mm. and some people really dislike that idea too but it might be the one that like best fits the evidence um i think i i'm leaning toward that that account explains orgasms that come from more like clitoral stimulation because the clitoris and the penis are homologous Mm. but i think other aspects of female orgasmic nature like deeper orgasms ones that come from more cervical region i think they need to have a bit of a different explanation that's been kind of the angle i'm leaning toward right okay did you always like um leaving high school did you always know you're going to go into school and like take like some kind of route whether it be evolutionary psychology and your phd or just something else like were you always sure that you were going to university oh yeah. yeah i loved I loved school. I always did really well in school. Right. It was the like structured environment was good for me. I always got high grades and based a lot of my self-esteem mm-hmm. on getting high grades. And as soon as I was able to apply to university, like I think I applied for university in September of my grade 12 year. Like I was oh, so yeah. ready and I lived in a small town. So mm-hmm. I was really excited to get out into a big city too. So yeah, but my path definitely ended up being kind of different than I thought it would be. I never, I didn't plan to go into academia. That sort of was an accident. Mm. I bet a lot of people in academia say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, do you, you studied in Vancouver as well? Is yeah. That correct? Yeah. Simon yeah. Fraser University is in Burnaby. Right. So right outside of Vancouver. Right. And um, you were there at one point, correct? Like yeah. You're doing I, it... I lived there when I did my master's degree. Right. So that would have been 2010 to 2012. Mm-hmm. And you, you busked a little bit in Vancouver, correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. You, how was that out in Vancouver? I feel like it's pretty lively. Or Sorry, not Vancouver exactly. What yeah, you said. but we, um, yeah, I had a friend, have a friend named Johannes who plays violin. And at that time I was doing a lot right. of uh, like pole dancing mm-hmm. and sort of like somewhat erotic performance, but not, but still kind of like PG enough to be <laughs> out in public. And we ended up just making this act where he would play violin and I would pole dance and we were doing it in Gastown, which is a pretty touristy oh, yeah. district. And 
it was a lot of fun. Yeah, I bet it seems like it would be. Yeah, we got we got good feedback. Like people loved mm-hmm. it. Um, Just yeah. good. Nobody there wasn't. Do you ever have any problems? It was odd, like creepy person, right. but that was dealt with pretty easily. But yeah, we would busk until we were kind of too tired, and then count up all our money and go buy a burger and yeah. have a beer and it was nice that's good it seems like the type of life that people are looking for when they go out there all the time too not necessarily busking in particular but just it, when i was reading an article that somebody wrote on you um doing that and it just from the responses you were giving them it seemed like um it was really freeing almost and just being able to go out there and just yeah just pursue what you wanted to it seemed like yeah just to because that kind of performance i was doing obviously pole dancing you mostly find in a strip club Mm -hmm. and um i didn't you know end up going into that kind of work ever though i had lots of friends at that time that were because i got into pole dancing originally through fitness and Mm. it was kind of from this female empowerment um you know like loving your body and i started that in edmonton and then i i brought it with me to vancouver and and sometimes it was hard to find you know performance venues because my uh, performance partner and I were looking for places kind of that would want to host our act, but like right. it's kind of hard to explain to people and it's kind of weird and That's you need fair. quite a bit of space or set up the portable pole. And at that time I was doing a bit of performance at music festivals and like, like kind of in rave culture mm. too. And the busking, I'm not even sure how he came up with the idea, but Johannes was a, like he had been involved kind of in like circus performance before. Oh, okay. So we were just uh, like, oh, let's just, you know, if we like can't find somewhere to do it, we'll just like do it on the street. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it seemed really cool. And you, yeah. you said you um started in Edmonton. Like, you're, were you taking classes? Or? Yeah, I did my undergrad in Edmonton at oh, U of A. Okay. So I grew up in a small town outside of Edmonton. Mm-hmm. Moved to Edmonton for school, and then while I was in school, I ended up um yeah like getting hired to teach pole dancing fitness. Oh, I right. had a long background with dance. Um, yeah, I actually how I found out about pole dancing, I was on the Edmonton Rush lacrosse team, oh, yeah. dance team. Just like a funny chapter of my life because it ended up overall being kind of a really bad experience. Oh, no, really? And now I guess the Edmonton Rush is actually in Saskatchewan, right? It's a Saskatchewan yeah, team Yeah, we have the Sask- Saskatchewan. Yeah. So me and some of my dance friends, like my sister and a few of our friends, we saw, I think this was my first year of university, saw like advertisements for like, like tryout to be mm. on the dance team for the new lacrosse team and you know it's like a national sport I'm like wow, that'd be really cool yeah. like, and it wasn't a cheer team because you know football have cheerleaders and and we were dancers and there's kind of like a difference between mm. the two and we tried out and made it onto this team and it was yeah just a very unique experience because they have certain rules like um like you're supposed to come off as like desirable so you're not mm. supposed to tell people that you have a boyfriend um uh, and you know, you get like free tanning minutes and like hairstyling. This feels like a different age. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, but really, really about the image. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 And like I got put on probation once for like being too fat. Really? <laughs> yeah. And it was oh kind of God. at that time I ended up another woman on the team named Nicole. She had been teaching pole dancing fitness. She's like, and she just saw that I would like it. Like I had never done it before. She's mm. like, I think you should like this. Like you should come check out our studio. And then I ended up like working for the pole dancing studio and then quitting the um, Edmonton Crush, we were called. <laughs> quitting that at the same time, which was really good for my personal health. It probably felt good health. to walk away. Yeah, yeah. it did. There was it, it was a lot of drama and yeah, just people weren't treated super well. Yeah. It was it was a neat experience, like to be like I'm on a national sport dance team, but and the Edmonton Rush lost every game that season too, mm. so it was kind of hard to stay like hyped up when your and team right. yeah. <laughs> lost yeah, every no single kidding. game. <laughs> so when you were teaching it, is it like, um, when you're teaching pole dancing, is it purely from like the fitness and like, um, the fitness side of it? Or is there like, is, is I don't even know how to ask this question. Are you like, um, trying to teach the sensuality of it as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was, it, when I worked, the first company I worked at, Aradia, it was a lot of, came from the female empowerment perspective. So you're like, helping women get comfortable in their bodies, helping women feel comfortable like dancing sexy. Cause we'd have lots of women be like, Oh, I'm not sexy or like, I can't move like that. And just kind of giving them like the opening or the invitation. Like it's okay to move like that. Yeah. Um, so that was a really fun atmosphere. And we also would teach lots of stagettes and bachelorette parties. So like women would come with all their friends and for an hour and 
teach a fun little dance and take pictures with the bride. Yeah. And yeah, at that time, like I loved it. It was so fun and it was great, like extra income while I was in school. Mm -hmm. Um, and now, you know, that I'm older looking back on it, I've like been exposed to different kinds of say feminist critiques around Mm -hmm. pole dancing. Cause there's kind of like, in the early days it's like well i'm a pole dancer not a stripper and there's this sort mm. of like built-in like oh like i don't want to be a stripper and now i've seen you know women who work in like nightclubs you know doing like nude pole dancing it's like they can see some of the women in the fitness world as like appropriating you know their dancing oh really like just how we talk about cultural appropriation yeah. it's like oh you like learn the moves from strippers and then you're going to be like oh but i'm not like them oh. i'm going to take it and like sell it to you know, wealthy women who kind of want to feel naughty, but who won't get judged for right. it. So it's neat having, I'm, yeah, I'm not, not doing that right now, but um, when I was in that world long enough to kind of have these different perspectives on right. it. There's an interesting dichotomy. I never thought that it would have, I, I just, that would have never occurred to me. That... Yeah. And it ends up being kind of controversial mm-hmm. uh, when it starts out as sort of, you know, this thing that like should be helping women and is, but then it can kind of create almost, I guess, like woman to woman, um, fighting or discontent. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I ended up kind of just tapering off pole dancing leading up to the time I got pregnant. I think I just intuitively knew that my body needed different sort of exercise. It's like very athletic and intense and it, it contrasts a lot with how you want your body to be while you're pregnant or birth giving. That's fair. There's a woman right now, I think that was, has been trending and she's, um, she didn't stop her um, her weightlifting program when she was pregnant, and she I, she claimed it's safe. I didn't really look into it much. I just saw, came across one video, but she was like, I think she was like still six, seven months, and was doing like um, like Olympic weightlifting still. And the comments were giving her a lot of flack, but she was claiming that it was um, it was completely safe. It just reminded me of that because you. Were yeah, like I have some friends that yeah lifted weights all through their pregnancy. I wasn't really ever a big weightlifter, so I think. It would probably depend on where your body was at right. before you got pregnant. But just in terms of um, like the pelvic floor and abdominal muscles go through so much change. And the, the hormones in our body when we're pregnant, they make your tissue like really soft and gooey. Mm. So you don't have as much like structure to hold hold your body in. And if you're doing things where you're really trying to like hold it tight, it could also make your pelvic floor a lot tighter. I see. Which would be more challenging. Mm-hmm. giving birth if there's like a lot of tension um but i'm sure yeah i always say like in general you know women kind of know their bodies the best mm-hmm. yeah with pole dancing it's so much core work so like the abdomen just becomes like very tight and engaged and it's right. good to let it soften when we're mm-hmm. pregnant and preparing for birth <laughs> yeah no kidding so you've been teaching pole dancing in classes and um and you're doing your research as well of the two between teaching and doing research, which would you prefer? Do you think? Like, are you? I just just to be clear, I haven't been teaching dance for a while now, kind of since right, I had my sorry. babies. Um, but they balance each other really nicely because PhD work is so mental and like sedentary, and then dancing is a nice way to get mm-hmm. back in my body and kind of out of my head. So I like doing them both. I was teaching a little bit like freeform dance after I had my daughter. Um, but then that stopped and then the pandemic hit. So there hasn't really been opportunity, you know, for group fitness classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how'd you get into lecturing specifically? That's actually funny too. When I, so I met my now husband, then boyfriend, we were both in Vancouver at the same time, but he's from Saskatchewan and I had finished school And he wanted to come back to U of S to finish his bachelor's degree. And so he asked me to move with him and we had just started dating, but Mm. we were in love and, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. And it was kind of spontaneous. And we moved to Saskatchewan together. And while we were preparing to move, I had applied to lecture at U of S and I thought it was a long shot because I only had a master's degree. And then I was really surprised. It actually offered me a job. That's probably exciting. It was really exciting so I didn't think that was even possible but about like a week or two after they offered me the job they called me back I'm like sorry we actually can't give you the job because someone with more seniority applied for that contract and we like missed their paper so mm-hmm. they have um, 
like the teaching unions have these strict rules. Like if you've been teaching a course so many times, you get first rights over that course oh, if you're not part of the faculty. Um, so I was totally crushed because I got the yeah. job offer and then they rescinded it. But then it didn't take long, like a year or two where I got, I did get a contract and then I did a bunch of teaching for the distance ed group at U of S. Mm. So I was teaching personality psychology kind of through correspondence. And then eventually I got the evolutionary psych lecture, which was really exciting. And I've been doing that for quite a while now. I really enjoyed your class. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And people, people love it. Cause it, you know, talks about all these like real world things mm. like sex and relationships. That's kind of, I think the big one that catches people's attention. Mm. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that. I felt like it was actually, I was learning things about, I was learning about things that I could observe a lot right. of the time. Just like stuff I could, I could think of examples in my own, in my own life for most of the concepts we talked about, which is really cool because in, it actually feels a little bit more engaging that way I found. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, sometimes I think some of the psychology can feel a bit removed. Because I, I always said, especially with say a sex differences which in today's culture is like a very controversial topic and i've spent a lot of time studying that topic um like the best place to see evolutionary psychology in action is go to a playground and like watch mm-hmm. all the little boys and girls playing and you can really see some differences yeah. just how they navigate each other and the equipment and all that yeah yeah for sure i yeah i don't know i when i was reading it i would um or reading it when i, when I was taking the course i would after class all the time, my dad and I would talk about everything, and that was his observation as well. He was just, every time I'd say something new that I learned, he'd be like, this just seems like all the stuff that he believed. Like, he was, um, this is just, it all made sense to him. Right. He was like, this just seems, like, logical. Right. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool. It's really interesting. Yeah, and I think maybe that's where some of the criticisms of evolutionary psychology come from, too, where people are like, oh, you're just confirming, like, stereotypes or intuitions, and it's mm-hmm. not really scientific. Um, but yeah, I think it does appeal to people because they like sense like, yeah, like, you know, humans do have that relationship to the rest of the animal Mm -hmm. world and you can see the, this continuity and patterns of behavior. Yeah. Yeah. I think people give it a lot of flack sometimes because it's hard to, um, test hypotheses, but, um, I don't know. I didn't, it didn't, I didn't get the sense that it made it any less valid. Like it, it all still seemed just as, just as true or just as valid as any of the other, any of the other psych classes I was taking. Yeah, and I think, and you know, this might be my own bias, but I feel like it has to be understood on a bit of a different level because it, it's the type of psychology that unites all of the other kinds. Mm-hmm. Like in my master's degree, I did a lot of work on evolutionary origins of mental illness, and I think it helps like clinical psychology if you have some evolutionary footing because mm-hmm. like it's, it's, it would be the same thing. You know, if people are studying like kinesiology or the body, you have to understand sort of like you know, how your shoulder develops or why is it prone to certain kinds of injuries or how is it supposed to function? It's the same thing with our mind or social skills. Like how are they supposed to function? Or like Mm -hmm. why, what kind of problems do they solve or what possibilities do they have? And like, how can they get, you know, distorted or injured through time? Something, a topic I was really excited to ask you about was um, astrology. So you are an astrological consultant, is that right? Um, I give people readings. Right. Um, I still like calling myself a student of astrology because astrology is like the deepest subject that someone can fall into. Mm. And that's how a lot of people describe it. Like it kind of, it, astrology comes and gets you as opposed to the other way around. This fair. Um, so yeah, I do like accept money for readings. It's not my full-time thing, mm. but I've been doing it on and off probably, uh, probably for about seven years. Um, I haven't for a couple years because of babies and the pandemic, but I was doing readings at the Fringe Festival, mm-hmm. which is really fun. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't look up any, once I saw that you did that on your website, I didn't look any further into it because I, yeah. I wanted you to explain it to me. I don't really know much about astrology. I know what my sign is. Right. That's about it. What's your um, sign? I'm a Sagittarius. Oh, nice. And we're, so your birthday's coming up pretty soon. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. On the 17th year. Um, nice. Yeah, I, I've never really looked into it a whole lot. I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I agree with you, but I really wanted to see, I wanted you to explain it to me because I don't... Yeah, and I've I've definitely had people in the science community judge me for studying astrology. There was, was actually a them. professor at U of S, I won't name them, but I approached them to maybe work with for my PhD. Mm-hmm. And um, 
he like, you know, saw my grades and my scholarship work and was like, oh yeah, like this is great. And then we had a meeting and he checked out my website and started astrology and was just offended. And like, really? like that's the same thing as believing in ghosts. Um, and like, how can you, you know, do both? And like, it was the grounds for him not wanting to work with wow. me, which is fine. Cause maybe, you know, we wouldn't have gotten along. Yeah. I guess uh, so. Right? To me, like, if we think about science as a method, not as a religion, but I think especially in the pandemic times, it's clear like some people treat science like a religion. Like mm -hmm. the scientist said so, it must be true, or this is what science says. And I think we have to keep reminding people that science is a method, a cumulative method through mm -hmm. time, practiced by fallible people. And even though astrology is really the roots of science, because it involves like a lot of observation and categorization and like mm. tracking things through time and making correlations um but i would approach astrology with a different mindset um so part of it is just being tied to nature like you know kind of paying attention to how you feel in different seasons like, you know people think of astrology as the planets and that's obviously a huge part of it but it's like a um that life has this like cyclical nature, you know, things mm -hmm. grow and things die and things you kind of feel different ways throughout the year. And like that to me is just true by experience. Like even just on my Facebook the other day, I was saying something about like the Sagittarius sun because we're in Sagittarius right. season. I went for a walk yesterday and Sagittarius has this quality of like clarity, like mental clarity and um, like brightness. Like they really want to see um, and like think to new heights and Saskatoon to me is such a nice place in Sagittarius season because you know all the leaves are gone from the trees mm -hmm. the sky is clear it's kind of cold and like the sun just shines in this really beautiful way and so like that's some of the ways I relate to astrology like it kind of helps me make sense of my relationship to nature and people who sciencey people who get really like offended by astrology I think they have a little bit too much hubris because astrology is like an ancient practice mm. and like i said it's the roots of science and you know at one point astrology and astronomy were wedded together and this idea that astrology like should kind of be tossed aside like i think that's shows that people haven't looked into it deeply enough and not like everyone needs to study it but it's such a like you know every culture has some form of astrology it ties things together like imagination, myth and storytelling with repeated cycles through time, um, with careful observation, development of technology. Like it permeates every part of being a human and like having culture. So it is, it's a sacred thing to me. And um, yeah, I really like practicing it. And I don't, it's, it's funny that you bring this up because I just, um, I have Twitter. And I don't use it a lot. Like I, I don't tweet a lot, but I read mm. other people's stuff. But last night I tweeted something about how people who are really sciencey, and I say that as kind of like, you know, they think they believe in science, but maybe they don't fully understand what science is, will have this criticism like, oh, like, well, there's no mechanism. You know, like we don't, like how can a planet affect a person? And because they don't see a mechanism they think that it can't right can't work and then i've had this had people offer the same criticism when we're talking about other phenomena so one of my friends who's a big advocate in women's health was saying how she's observed that the covid vaccine has affected lots of women's menstrual cycles mm. and someone's like well the evidence is showing that it doesn't have a big effect and and also there's no mechanism by which it should and and I just kind of drew that parallel, and it and it bothers me because I people are limiting. It's like okay, if I can't imagine, or if I don't know what the mechanism is that links those two things, like there's no way it could be connected. Mm. And I just feel like that's like a really big barrier to put on our understanding. Because if um, you know, we might not understand why the planets seem to have this influence on people's day to day life and how they behave and express themselves, but like enough enough people can observe that they they are connected there's mm -hmm. some kind of connection or correlation so just because we don't know what the mechanism is it doesn't matter yeah yeah well and like i said like i'm not 
I'm not sure that I believe in it, but I would never go so far to tell you you're wrong just because right. like I, I find like you're talking about uh, people drawing that parallel. Well, this doesn't have, a, let's say that there's no mechanism in astrology, but then um, they will use that same argument to kind of push away like other findings that are considered more scientific. Mm -hmm. But um, it just, I don't know. I, I guess I just agree with you. I don't know why um, there would have to be or we, why you'd have to prove something like that. I don't know. I guess it's, I'm just trying to say that. I, I think it's ignorant of people to just pretend that they know that it's untrue. I think it's the wrong like, order of events. Because say like there's that famous example in science, you know, um, Semmelweis and hand washing. I don't know if you've learned that no. through science, but like Semmelweis was, I don't know if he was a doctor or a scientist. I don't well, remember the whole story. Really but yeah, it's, it's kind of an example people use in teaching science because he was doing hypothesis testing. Mm. And he's like, oh, maybe all of these, you know, women giving birth are dying because doctors aren't washing their hands after they touch the dead bodies. And that's mm. what was happening. They were you know, dealing with dead bodies and then going and putting their hands in women that right. were birthing and then those women and their offspring were dying. He's like, oh, maybe there's some kind of like invisible material mm. that's transferred from the corpse to the woman and it makes them sick. And people were like, oh, oh sure. Like <laughs> invisible tiny material. Like yeah. that's crazy. Uh, and, you know, and he didn't know the mechanism. Like he didn't know germs uh, or things like that. But he like was seeing that there was a connection. Like, oh, the doctors that go from this hospital, that hospital, their patients die. But the doctors who just work in this part of the hospital, their patients don't die. So he saw a connection and then was trying to figure out explanations and mechanisms. And that's, I think, like, you know, when women are having this experience, like, oh, my yeah. menstrual cycle was affected by the vaccine. Like, maybe there's a mechanism that explains it. Instead of being like, oh, well, I can't imagine how there would be a mechanism, so there must not be. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of comes from this, like, seeing the body as a machine metaphor, which um, I disagree with and I mm -hmm. think is outdated and you know an astrology would see humans like you know we're part of nature we're embedded in the cycles yeah. of nature yeah i agree with you yeah well exactly i think just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's true it's especially like i don't know i find those type of arguments are pretty odd too because a lot of the time they come from people that are super religious but will um discount astrology it's like right. well whereas like if like you're you're using an argument against something and then just like choosing not to use it in your own beliefs. Right. Right. So on. Well, I'm pretty sure like I know in Christianity and maybe in Islam too, there's, there are like warnings against using astrology. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't, I don't know my like Bible verses well enough, but there's definitely like, yeah, kind of like lecture against mm. using the stars to portend. But there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of astrological literature on all of the, astrology references in christianity mm -hmm. um like the three wise men as the three stars or ryan's bells or something like that there's a yeah. that's a whole deep interesting area too i think unfortunately people just especially today it seems like people are just picking teams and trying to make sure that nobody else is right that's so. definitely the world we yeah. <laughs> live in yeah um do you think like from your studying or being a student of astrology do you think there's a mechanism that not necessarily one that you've learned or you think is true, but just something that you could observe or just like an idea. I think there has to be one. Like there's certain techniques I use in astrology and the way that they kind of like symbolically explain specific events in people's lives. Like I really do feel like there's one that would be, you know, my like ultimate scientific accomplishment would be to figure that out <laughs> the proving mechanism in astrology yeah and and not like maybe the the ultimate mechanism but there's so there, there's a specific technique i use it's called secondary progressions and what it does is uh, it takes like the days following your birth and matches those onto a year so like mm. the third day of your life would have the astrological picture for the third year of your life mm. So kind of like the first, you know, three months of your, of your life as a baby, like kind of tells us about, you know, the 90 years of your right. life. And I, th and that technique for me and my clients works really well. Mm. Like it really maps out these kind of ebbs and flows and turning points in their life. And 
having studied a little bit of, you know, developmental biology, like we know the time in utero and the time after you're born, there's these sensitive periods where like parts of our biology are, for lack of a better word, like are, are programmed. Right. You know, or even when we talk about, say, like really early trauma, like how much that imprints a person's personality or their nervous system. So I think that there is something like physical and observable there. Mm. I'm not quite sure where to look, but um, I've, I've pondered it a little bit. I've chatted with a few people about it. It's kind of my like, I know maybe it'll be my project when I'm retired or when my kids are older, but it's like in the background, like it's yeah. always kind of percolating there. It's definitely an interesting topic. Yeah, and there's this other mechanism in genetics. What's it called? It's called genetic assimilation, mm-hmm. where, say, something... Let's see if I can explain this right, because I might forget part of it. But say something, like, in our biology... I think, like, the circadian rhythm is an example of this, where originally it's, like, the presence of the light, you know, makes mm-hmm. our brain uh, release certain hormones. So we follow this, like, day-night cycle. But eventually that instead of it being the light that triggers it, um, a genetic mechanism like takes over it. So a human could be away from light for a long time and there's you know, genes in cells in their brain that are creating that hormonal cascade in absence of light. Mm. So something that was in the environment becomes assimilated into the genetic um, instructions. And I wonder if that is somehow connected to astrology because a big part of astrology is just light yeah like we study the sun and the moon a lot and Mm. um so you mean like like cosmic patterns and cycles just kind of like being mapped out on the on genes and then they take over when it's not necessarily available sometimes yeah maybe that would explain how like we can look at the sky and see a pattern and see how that kind of relates to someone's experience but like there's not maybe still that causal connection between the Mm. two but somehow our body like incorporated these patterns into our development right so yeah that's sort of my like initial thoughts on it but i think it's a problem worthy of consideration i think any good astrologer has really pondered what the mechanisms are Mm. and some accept like i don't really know but i trust that the method works so i use it and then some people have you know their own explanation Mm -hmm. even just like oh our bodies are mostly made of water and gravity and heavenly bodies like you know pull on the water like the tides like some people just use that yeah yeah oh, i had a question but i can't oh um a lot of i think a lot of people attribute um cold reading to astrology is that like um i, I guess i was just wondering if like so when you take like an, a sagittarius like myself for example does everybody born in that time frame have to be explainable under that lens or like, like how that's does it... what we would call sun sign astrology hmm. where you're like looking at people's kind of personality characteristics based on the time of year that they were born right. and in the broad system of astrology that's a really small part because hmm. what we do is we look at kind of the whole sky so we look at all of the planets and their geometrical patterns with each other too Mm. um and this kind of goes back to like pythagoras and like platonic and aristotelian philosophy like some geometrical patterns are more harmonious and then there's also like elemental approaches too. like if someone you know it's just sort of like a hippocrates like it's older than that but that idea of like um you know people who are more fiery or more watery so we would expect that all like Sagittarius people have like some things in common. Right. Like, like I was saying with like the, the clarity of mind or being high minded, like Sagittarius is kind of associated with like higher education. Mm. Um, and like with teaching even. So even like you being interested in, you know, right. hearing the stories of teachers, like that's sort of like a Sagittarius theme mm. in general, but sun sign astrology would definitely be limited. It's like a really kind of like, quick quick, like i'd call it pop astrology right you know people like oh what's my sign but yeah we look at a lot of things like something i look at really closely is lunar phase like were you born during a full moon or a new moon and that actually has a pretty big imprint i've observed on people's personality Mm. it seems to yeah um i had like i had another question about so with astrology um 
are you trying to uh, look at how you should interact with the world or how the world is making you behave or sorry not even no, i guess not the world necessarily but you know where i'm going with that yeah i, th- I think uh like, like there's that, that question of kind of determinism or fate and free will. Right, yeah, that's where it's going. And some, I, there's, you know, aspects of more traditional ancient astrology that do seem more deterministic. Where like, you might see things described more as like, oh, like a bad astrology chart or a mm-hmm. good, like this is a good thing, that's a bad thing. And modern astrology, I think, has some great innovations in like, talking about like how like, Things that aren't always like you can't always classify as good or bad, but it's maybe like a challenge or an opportunity for someone to grow. Um, but I think practicing astrology like teaches me that everyone is so unique from one another, and that it gives me more empathy for people. Because mm. say like maybe you know someone and they they have like a certain you know complex or an issue where they're kind of always doing something that like annoys you and you're like oh why are they always so insecure or why do they always why are they always late or I don't know like little things about people that little quirks that could kind of bug people when I look at someone's chart you're kind of like oh like I can really see how that would be like a big struggle for them right and then it gives me a little bit more compassion so that's like the actual art of practicing astrology teaches me that and it really helps like honor yeah honor people as individuals Mm. which is what I like about it so I don't know if it like, you know, tells people to live a certain way. And even within astrology, people would have different approaches. Like, um, like there's people who kind of come at it from more of the magical tradition. Like, okay, I want this thing in my life. So I'm going to track the sky and like do a magic spell at a certain time to try to, you know, get myself more money or get myself a job. And mm-hmm. then there'd be people who maybe more and see like this, I'd say is more like observable in Chinese astrology where like, you're you're trying to harmonize with your environment. It's like, okay, like today's gonna be a really challenging day, so I'm gonna lay low and maybe just clean my house. I see. As opposed to trying to like like press your will into the world, as opposed to like, okay, I'm observing the the quality of the day or the year and mm-hmm. trying to go with that instead of fight against it. Right. It doesn't actually seem too far off of what I believe to be honest i do you know the about the Tao, like the a little bit yeah, yeah. i'm kind of i subscribe not fully to that but i'm i'm really into the ancient chinese studies of stuff like that like the, the way of the universe and the force of the universe so it seems fairly similar yeah and chinese know. astrology has uh, like it's you know deeply connected to the I Ching, and um it's really old mm-hmm. and from what i've studied about it a little bit is that chinese astrology seems to actually have quite a bit of like empirical roots like there was a lot of observation and kind of like creating the system based on what they observed mm-hmm. through time and it was about like harmonizing it oh like you know babies are born in the spring so one shouldn't go to war in the spring because that's when life is happening so like mm. go and kill people at war in the fall because that's when <laughs> things are dying like there's this sort of like yeah like going, yeah going with the flow of things well i think they they follow it quite a bit still don't they as well like as I far as i know i don't want to speak too much about it like yeah um my yeah i've learned a lot of chinese astrology from my friend sue and you know we're both like um white western european background but she's lived a long time in indonesia and i like has learned from some chinese masters i think she has a little bit more idea of how it fits with the culture Mm. than i would Uh, but yeah i think like there's definitely people that like say in matchmaking like parents might not want their child to marry someone of a certain sign because it might right. pretend like a less happy or more fortunate mm-hmm. marriage I've, I've heard that um the birth rates change quite a bit year to year too just following like um i've heard that too yeah like um uh, what is it like a horse year like horse children aren't seen as they're kind of like maybe harder to tame right yeah so people want like a rabbit or a dragon mm-hmm. baby because i've luckier. heard dragon is really popular yeah because yeah. dragon you know, in this in the Chinese signs, dragon is the only like mystical animal. Like all of right. the other ones are, you know, worldly animals. Mm-hmm. So the dragon sort of has this like power and intrigue, I guess, that the other mm-hmm. signs don't. <laughs> yeah, it's, I really like study. I studied it a lot, and I guess not studied, but I was really into it in elementary school. It was always mm. really interesting to me. And yeah, I've sometimes really... it just intrigues people, right? Yeah, or it resonates. I'd say like that word can get used a lot like overused maybe in new age culture but it's true like some things you read and you're like that really does feel like it captures some part of me mm-hmm. and you know i've studied 
personality psychology and taught it a little bit. And, you know, there's like the Jungian tests and um, the Myers-Briggs, like all of these different. But for me, like astrology feels a lot like it captures more of people than those tests do, Mm -hmm. in my personal opinion. Maybe betraying psychology, but that's how I feel. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We don't have much more time. There's one subject that I wanted, one more subject I wanted to get into. Um, To quote you from one of your, I think it was one of the blog posts, you said, the notion that you can simply remove a uterus from a woman and insert it into a male body has got to be the most perfectly aggravating example of reductionist biology I have encountered. I learned about this uh, about uterus uterus transplants like um last night or no two nights ago and then okay. i read your blog post and i was like well wow. i didn't believe my buddy when he told me i was like i don't i was like i, I was like i don't know that doesn't i just didn't believe him and i read your blog post and i agreed with you with the things you said um but yeah i just was curious to i wanted to hear you talk out loud about it yeah that's a that's a controversial note to end on that yeah. that blog post has by far been the most controversial piece of writing mm. i ever put out like i did lose friends over it mm. mostly probably just one friend but yeah i mean it comes out of my interest in this whole sex and gender culture war and also a little bit from my just personal beliefs about like honoring um nature right. the female body like the process of life and creation and yeah when i heard or read I don't remember how I found the first paper but I was studying something like for my PhD work and somehow I found this like oh like could we do uterus transplants transplants into trans women and I was just I was so deeply offended Mm. that was my honest reaction that I had to write something especially having a little bit of experience like research experience in women's healthcare, like the kinds of things that women are suffering with every day like you know, endometriosis, adenomyosis, like infertility, PCOS, and, you know, waiting so long to see doctors and not having good cures. And the fact that like research attention is kind of going into this kind of like science fiction direction where like, oh, like, could we do this to make like such a small group of people like kind of like feel happier maybe in their bodies? Like it just seems to me like such a, um, the poor use of resources and not to mention all like yeah the potential effects of it yeah it, the level of like experimentation with the body and mm-hmm. um i find kind of i do find problematic yeah well yeah i know i was reading it and i i just I, everything you were saying i was i actually actually started talking like out loud to myself as, as i was reading it and that's like a pretty good sign for me that i know that i'm interested in something is if nobody's around and i start making noises while I'm <laughs> watching or, re- or reading something and um you said frankenstein-esque at one point and that's the part that stood out to me the most i think because i don't really have a stake in this conversation i don't okay. i don't okay. think but um uh you're talking about just how complex that system is and to think that it just can be transplanted like that it, kind of it like seems a car like, part yeah yeah we come back to this idea of like people seeing the body as a machine and you can just like add on or remove parts and anyone who's kind of like lived the female reality mm-hmm. or that's studied female health from a more holistic perspective like just knows that's not true like even Like another part of my PhD work, I've been studying endometriosis in a lot of depth. And Mm. when women have really severe endometriosis or related conditions, sometimes they end up getting a hysterectomy, which is the, you know, removal of the uterus. And, you know, some women want that because they experience so much pain and suffering from the disease. But we now know, like, removing the uterus has lots of downstream consequences that we're Mm. only just starting to understand. And one of them is dementia, like drop in IQ. Mm. So it's like, and, and, you know, now we have trans men so biological females that want to live as men like they're having hysterectomies at younger ages i'm pretty sure even doctors in saskatoon do them i just and like i the idea that we should like cut out a healthy organ that has a a part in like a whole body system because that person doesn't feel comfortable with it i i think that's dangerous territory to get Mm -hmm. into i know there's some interesting you know stories in the media like where um like we're saying like a woman like really wanted to be blind like every now and then there's people who like identify with like a disabled experience like i really want to be blind and there's one example 
from a few years back where like a woman like purposely blinded herself. Mm-hmm. And, you, and yeah. yeah, and most people wouldn't be like, oh, that's a good idea. Like she wanted that, she identified as a blind person and so she made herself blind. But like, it's a similar thing to what we're doing. Like I identify mm-hmm. as someone without a uterus, so, like I want a doctor to cut it out. And like, should those medical resources go toward cutting out a uterus? What are the downstream effects that we don't even really understand? And also like, you know, is the person going to, regret that years later like mm-hmm. i've heard a lot of a lot about that kind of stuff is that these decisions even if it is even if it does help the person feel better in their body or psychologically just that i've heard that a lot of the time just any anything along that route can have more negative impacts long term yeah and i don't positive. think we fully understand like one another trend that's happening is you know more women um getting mastectomies so like getting their breasts removed mm. And not because of breast cancer, but because of how they prefer their body to look or how they feel they need their body to look to feel comfortable in their own skin. Um, But something that happens when you have like a big surgery and lots of flesh removed is like massive amounts of scar tissue. And scar tissue can like cause adhesions like throughout your fascial network and your fascial network is your whole body. Mm -hmm. And if you mess with one part of it, like it ricochets through your whole body. And I, I watched this one video of a um, female who had had her breasts removed. I think it was like seven or eight years ago. And she's still dealing with all these mobility and chronic pain issues mm. from the scar tissue. And, you know, so under the medical principle of do no harm, like, is it less harmful to remove a healthy body part? Because that person, you know, thinks like emotionally, psychologically, that's what they want. And like, what are other ways of maybe helping people feel more comfortable in their own skin? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's what I personally think is a better idea. But I know there's lots of people who disagree with me. To me too, it's this interesting clash of kind of capitalism and like individual entitlement. The fact that like we think like, oh, because that surgery is available, like I should be able to have it. When there's, you know, there's lots of people who need all kinds of healthcare that aren't getting it yeah. for things that are like medically necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It seems like there could be a better use for those resources. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think that's all the time we have. Um, thank you so much for coming on and being my first guest. I was very excited to have you. I'm honored to be your first guest. That thank was really great. Yeah, I really enjoyed our conversation. You did your research well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Awesome.